Okay. Good morning again, everyone. For those of you who were here last week, I hope you have a nice weekend and spent all the weekend preparing for this week. No, I'm just joking. Hope you also had a, some visit to the local area and enjoyed your time, your weekend in Italy. Uh, for those of you who just arrived, very welcome to the second week of the workshop. I'm just going to steal a few minutes from Professor Wilkinson's uh, first talk because I realized that I never really introduced the faculty in the first week when I gave the introduction. So I just want to um, take this opportunity to also emphasize the extremely high level of the professors who are teaching these classes. I'm sure you're well aware, but um, it doesn't help just to remind you that the three organizers and directors of the schools and the uh, main lecturers are Hannah Rodriguez Hertz, who got her PhD from the University of Montevideo and is a professor of Universidad de la República in Montevideo, Uruguay, and has recently moved to the Southern University of Science and Technology in China. She's also the vice president of OAS, which is the Organization for Women in Science in Developing Countries. Uh, she gave a presentation about this a few days ago. Uh, Corinna Ulchigrai got a PhD from Princeton University under the direction of Yaakov Sinai. And she's a professor of University of Bristol. And this year, she will be on leave at the University of Zurich this coming year. And Professor Amy Wilkinson, who got a PhD from Berkeley and is a professor of the University of Chicago and was an invited speaker at the last International Congress of Mathematicians, which, as you know, is a very prestigious honor to be able to give one of these talks. So there would be lots more to say, but you can easily find out. I just really want to emphasize that uh, in relation, for example, to one of the panel discussions where we talked about what is good research and the difficulty of distinguishing good research and bad research, I think having the time here and having the possibility of talking to them and looking at the research that they do, you can be sure that whatever they do is good research. So I encourage you very much to, once again, to take the opportunity of their availability to talk to you during this whole week here. We also have some fantastic tutors, uh, most of whom you know by now. Oliver Butterley was uh, my own PhD student in, in Imperial College and is now a postdoc here at ICTP. Irene Pasquinelli is uh, finishing, I think, her PhD at Durham University. Davide Ravotti was a PhD student of Corinna Ulcigrai. And Lucia Simonelli was a PhD student of Giovanni Forni at the University of Maryland and is now a postdoc at ICTP. And Kadim Wal is just arrived. He's here. Maybe you can stand up, Kadim, because you know they don't know you yet. And he is also one of the tutors joining us for the second week. He was my PhD student. He was a diploma student. So he was a, a, he's from Senegal and he was a student in the pre PhD diploma program that I talked to you about next week, uh, last week, and he then stayed on to do a PhD with me and he's now a postdoc at the University of Bochum in Germany. So, and he will, I think, give some of the lectures also this week. Um, but just as important a cast are you guys, and I want to emphasize something that is really special, which we have always have a lot of countries represented in ICTP conferences, here we have 50 countries, I think, I hope. And I think that's really amazing. I don't know how many places uh, have so many countries. I'm going to do, even if it takes a couple of minutes more, I want to do a little fun exercise, which is I'm going to call out the countries one by one. And I want the person from those countries to either put their hand up or stand up or shout, here I am, or somehow make themselves Available. Okay, let's see. Maybe not everyone is here right now, but let's try. Algeria. Yes, two. Armenia. Yay. <laughs> Belgium. Okay. Benin. All right. Bolivia. We don't have a Bolivia with us. Uh, <laughs> Brazil. Sorry? I am, yeah. Brazil, great. Canada, yes. Cameroon, yes. Chile, 
Yes, China. All right. <laughs> Colombia. Okay, we're missing the uh, Colombia. Costa Rica. Yay. Croatia. I know we've got a Croatia, but we don't have him here. Cyprus. Yes. Egypt. All right. France. Georgia. We've got Georgia somewhere. Ghana. Hungary. Yes. India. Okay. Indonesia. All right. Iran. Always a big group. Israel. It's nice to be able to see people from Iran and Israel sitting next to each other. Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Italy, okay, Korea, Macedonia, yes, Malaysia, all right, Mexico, yes, Nigeria, yay, Pakistan, okay, Peru, there we go, Poland, okay, Portugal, Russia, Senegal, yeah, Serbia, yes, uh, Spain, Sweden, Thailand, Togo, uh oh, Africa, we're having a bit of a problem with African countries, Trinidad and Tobago, yes, Tunisia, okay, Uganda, all right, Ukraine, okay, UK, USA, all right, Uruguay, okay, Uzbekistan, yes, Vietnam, all right, well, that is just fantastic to see, it's really, really, as you see, it's just one or two people from most countries, but also some bigger groups. And it's really, it's really great to have you all here. And as I said in the first week, this is really an important chance to interact between each other, take every opportunity you can to get to know each other, both from a human point of view and a scientific point of view. This is very important. And finally, let me conclude to remind you that tomorrow is African Night. So at ICTP, this is a social evening that is organized actually independently of our conference. It's a kind of in our social program, but it's an ICTP event. It's, not, it's just a lucky coincidence that we have it on our week. And it is usually a really great party up on the terrace here. And there is a, a live African music, an African performance, and a chance to wear your African clothes if you have them and a chance to dance and to see your professors dancing. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much and welcome to everyone. And so I will introduce Professor Amy Wilkinson, who uh, just arrived for the second week, and she will give the first lecture now. Thank you, Amy. Thanks. So I'm going to waste even more time from my precious lecture minutes. Um, how many people here, if you could just raise your hands, just arrived this week? This is your first. OK, keep them up. Little exercise. Everyone in the room, turn to the nearest person you don't know, or someone who just arrived this week, and introduce yourself. Say where you're from, and um, a little hello. So this is just a beginning get to know you session. Another five minutes. <laughs> New people, raise your arms for a sec. Okay.
are usually 15 minute lectures? Or? Yes. Okay. So We're keeping them short and it actually has been working very well. Okay. So is it okay? Got about 50. Sorry? Is it okay if I use 45 minutes? Out? Absolutely. No, use as much as you feel you need. Okay. There's a 20 minute break anyway, but we can extend that a little bit. So um, I hope you'll continue these conversations into the break. I almost don't want to start because I see such wonderful, lively conversations. So please, please continue these uh, later. Uh, so I'm giving the first lecture in a 10 lecture course. Um, originally, the lectures were going to be by me and Hannah Rodriguez Hertz. Um, we decided to mix it up a little bit, and uh, Hadim War is going to give a, a couple of the lectures as well. Uh, the subject of this course is smooth ergodic theory. So the point of these lectures is to examine the property of ergodicity and related properties, statistical properties of dynamical systems in some examples. And the first examples we're going to consider will be linear examples or what we might call rigid examples. And you've seen some of these if you were here last week, like a rotations of the circle and expansion by two on the circle or on the interval if you like. Um, so today is going to be a, a rather gentle, at least the first lecture, will be a rather gentle introduction um, to some of these examples, especially for those of you who weren't here last week. Um, I hope to challenge those of you who have seen a lot of this material before. Um, this is what your opportunity is at this conference. Your first, you get to meet other people who are interested in dynamics, come from a variety of backgrounds. I guarantee you that two people who know a lot of, uh, a lot of dynamics but come from different places know a lot of different dynamics. So for those of you who have already seen a lot of the material, you still have an opportunity to meet other people and learn from them. You have an opportunity to teach other people who have not maybe seen dynamics before at all, and give them your perspective. And you have an opportunity to be challenged by some of the exercises that we give you. Like last week, the plan is to give some exercises that should be accessible to most people, some more challenging exercises, and maybe some exercises that you're not going to finish in the problem session, but we'll have, you'll have some time to think about them for the rest of your life. So, right? Okay. <coughs> Excuse me for coughing. I made the stupid decision to try to run up those steps to get here today. So I kind of winded myself. Um, anyway. Okay. So uh, one more thing. Again, trying to waste as much time as I can. So my T-shirt or stress or whatever, um, depicts my relationship to mathematics. I eat mathematics. I am voracious. Um, I bite. But um, my teeth are made of hearts because I love mathematics. So I'm in some ways very gentle to it. But this is also a kind of reminder to you, although it's a kind of twisted reminder, that I don't bite. And I welcome questions, and I welcome people interrupting and saying I don't understand, or asking for clarifications, and coming and talking to me after lectures. I'm staying at the Adriatico, so you'll see me a lot, I'm sure. Breakfast, dinner, etc. OK, so ergodicity of smooth systems. is the topic, and as I've 
sort of started to say but kind of lost my train of thought. Um, we're going to start with linear or rigid systems. And then we're going to move on to more realistic kind of real world systems, which are dynamical systems that are differentiable but can't be they're smooth, they're nice in a lot of ways, but there's no nice, easy formula to write them down. Or if there is, the formula involves like transcendental functions. It's not nice and linear like the systems we're going to consider <coughs> at first. Okay, so the setting for these lectures uh, is the world of measure-preserving transformations. And to introduce notation, what are we looking at? We're looking at a, a triple of objects called a probability space, which together form a probability space. X is a set. B is a sigma algebra, and mu probability measure. Meaning that the measure of the whole space is one. Okay, so it's a measure defined on B is a set of objects that you can measure, they're subsets uh, they consist of subsets of X, okay, with various properties. Um, a measure-preserving transformation, or MPT for short, okay, so that's measure-preserving transformation, is a map, just a, a set map from X to X. Um, it's measurable, which means that the pre-image of a measurable set is measurable. And the probability measure mu is preserved. And we write that F star mu equals mu. F star mu is just the push forward, measures push forward. So if I take a B measurable, F star mu of B is just defined to be mu of f inverse of b. Okay, so this property is the same, is, sa is the same as saying that the measure of f inverse of b is the measure of b for all b measurable. Okay? Now, for the key examples that we will consider, typically, X will be, at the very least, a compact metric space. B is the sigma algebra generated by, by um, open sets, a, a Borel sigma algebra. And then mu is some measure defined on the Borel sigma algebra. OK. And so we write to denote a measure-preserving transformation. We package all this notation into a single picture and we write this to indicate that F is a measure preserving transformation. It preserves all of this structure. The one weird thing is we take F inverse of B, it doesn't have to equal B, but it needs to be contained in B. Okay, that's important. I shouldn't have said equals. Um, and you might think that's weird. Why not F of B contained in B? Well, that's because F inverse, taking inverse images, preserves the operations of intersection and union. And sigma algebras have to be closed under intersections and countable unions. So this is the sensible way to uh, define measurability, just as continuity is defined by saying F inverse of the set of all open sets is contained in the set of open sets. So an example, when X is a compact metric space, B is a Borel sigma algebra generated by open sets, of a, of a measurable map would be a continuous map, OK? So typically, our maps will be continuous. OK. So
First, I'm going to say, what is ergodicity? No. I think first I'm going to talk about some examples. All right. So one family of examples that you've seen last week are rotations of the circle. of the circle. So we're going to think of the circle as the quotient of the real numbers by the integers. OK? So the integers, draw a picture here. The integers are a subgroup of the real numbers. I add two integers, I get an integer. I invert an integer, uh, <coughs> sorry, an additive subgroup. So minus, I don't know why that was three. That should be minus one. And this quotient is also a group. Um, if I want to picture the circle, again, this should be review from last week. <coughs> if I want to picture the circle as this quotient, I can just take all the numbers between 0 and 1 <coughs> inclusively. And none of these numbers differ by an integer. So they're all distinct in the quotient. But 0 and 1 are the same. And so in the quotient, and everything else in the real line can be brought into, by, by translating by some integer, can be brought into this interval. So this interval is what we would call a fundamental domain. And we can think of the circle as just the interval, OK, with the two endpoints identified. So what's a rotation of S1? Well, I just take an element of the group. So I take alpha inside of R mod Z. Well, if I like, I could just take alpha in R. Because what I'm going to say will be well defined. And I define a transformation, f sub alpha, from r mod z to r mod z, that sends a point x to x plus alpha. Where we have to think of, if we think of this as being a map on 0, 1, that takes a point x <clears throat> to x plus alpha, and then you have to take it mod 1, or mod the integers. And why is it called a rotation? Well, it precisely is a rotation. If I take a point here, and I add, let's say alpha is a small number, I add alpha. I've moved it. <laughs> now, if I add alpha again, I'm over here. But now, that's identified. This is identified with the point here. And so if I think of R mod Z as a circle of circumference 1, then, then rotation by alpha, by, then F alpha takes any point, and it just rotates it through 2 pi alpha, the angle 2 pi alpha. alpha of x. All right. <clears throat> now, I've given you a transformation. I haven't given you a measure. I haven't even given you a sigma algebra. But let b be the Borel sigma algebra. So just the sigma algebra generated by intervals. And <clears throat> what's mu? Well, mu, I, I think you can't see that. So I'm going to go over here. is the Lebesgue measure how does it 
defined? Well, mu of any interval a, b is defined to be, so here a, b, uh, a, b are chosen, uh, are chosen in 0, 1 for now with a less than b. So it's chosen so that the measure of the interval uh, a, b is b minus a. Now, of course, if I have an interval that is not contained, but it has length less than 1, I can always translate it over and get a measure, uh, get an interval in 0, 1, and that's the measure. And I take the measure of the length of that interval. Once I have defined, again, I apologize if this is some review, but once you've defined a measure on, uh, on um, a sigma algebra, or let's say on a subset, here A is the set of intervals. In general, if I define a measure on the set of open sets, and B is a um, Borel sigma algebra, then something called the Karatea Dori extension theorem tells us that, in fact, this extends. So I have defined a measure on the set of intervals, so it's not really a measure. And it has some nice properties. So it's additive, et cetera. OK, so it has properties as close as you can get uh, to, being a me you know, to being a measure. But if, if, if once you've defined it here with the right properties, then the Karate-Adori extension theorem implies that this measure, this extends to a unique measure. And that's the Lebesgue measure. And in fact, this measure is a very special measure. The measure mu is, in fact, the unique measure that is invariant under all translations. Mu, this particular mu I've just defined, is the unique measure, I should say, I want a less than b, and I want b minus a to be less than or equal to 1 here. Mu is the unique probability measure on R mod z such that for any alpha in R mod z, F sub a star of mu is mu. So in other words, this is a measure that's actually invariant under any uh, rotation. Okay? And how you prove this very quickly is you do the following. And uh, th this is, I think, a good exercise for, you know, if you haven't done this before, proof. First of all, go to Google and look up the actual Karateodori extension theorem. Okay? Step two, show that F star or F alpha star of mu and mu are the same measures on this subset, the, the set of all intervals. Okay? Well, I, that should be clear, right? If I take the measure of an interval, I take the pre-image of that interval under any rotation, the length doesn't change. So 
it assigns the same measure to intervals, the push forward and this. Show that they are the same on A, and then the uniqueness of the Karateodori extension theorem tells you that the two measures that they generate have to be the same. Okay, so. Okay. Okay, Google it, because I didn't really, I just gave some kind of like hand wavy and kind of basically incorrect definition or statement. All right. <clears throat> so, therefore, so this is a very interesting fact. And <coughs> it has consequences. But since we're still talking examples, let's just go back to what we were saying. If I take any alpha in R mod Z, the rotation F sub alpha acting on R mod Z B mu, where this is Lebesgue, this is a measure preserving transformation. Okay, so that's our first most basic example, and I wanted to talk you through it slowly. Before we move on to example two, which is another example from last week. So this is the doubling map, but more generally we can do expanding maps. So the doubling map is also, I'm going to call it F again, but I won't put a subscript. That's also a map on the circle. And it's defined by f of x is equal to 2 times x. Now you might say, well, how does this make sense? Yeah. Well, I need to take this mod 1 or mod the integers. Why does what I wrote make sense? Well, it makes sense because if I have r up here, and I have the map that sends x to 2x, and I have this projection where I take the quotient by the integers. So this is the projection, okay, where x, a point in R, is just sent to the coset, if you like, x plus z. Then this diagram commutes. Meaning, like, if I, take an if I take an x here and I add some integer n and I double it, I get x plus 2n. And that's an integer. So I can project that down here. Okay, so just from, like, that kind of point of view, this makes sense. If you want to look at this map, however, <clears throat> as a map on the interval, the fundamental domain, 0, 1, so if I want to think of this as a map, okay, I'm going to draw the graph of f. I take the map f of x equals 2x. <coughs> As depicted, this is not a map from the interval to itself. It's a map from the interval to the interval 0, 2. But now, I try to make this picture look better. There's 1. Well, these numbers, I have to make them inside the fundamental domain, 0, 1, and this is what the graph looks like. And since these points are identified, I'll just draw it like that. Okay? <clears throat> Exercise. Prove
So this is um, level one, exercise part two. Prove, so let mu again be Lebesgue measure, Lebesgue Haar measure, let B be the Borel sigma algebra. Prove that for this doubling map, F star of mu equals mu. Prove that mu is invariant. Now, you might think that doesn't make any sense because if you double, you double length. So how on earth could I be preserving Lebesgue measure? But you remember that F star mu of a set is mu of F inverse of the set. And For those who were here last week, I assume this has been done as an exercise? In class. Okay, so it's a good review. But I just want to note that if I take F inverse of, let's say, an interval, I actually get two intervals of half of the length of the original. And so the measures of those two intervals add up to the measure of the original. All right, so these are, this again is review, I hope. But I'm also trying to introduce some new notation. Um, so example three is now in higher dimensions. So you guys have like seen the circle to death. So now let's talk about higher dimensions. So let's let x equal the torus. And we're big boys and girls, so I'm going to do this on an n-dimensional torus. But then I'll give you some examples. I'll give you, I'm going to talk you through an example where n is 2. So x is the n-dimensional torus. It's the quotient of Rn by the subgroup Zn. Well, mu is going to be Lebesgue measure on this quotient. How am I going to define this? Well, I'll define it. So this is a product of R mod Z with itself, so exercise n times. So this is the torus. It's a product of n circles. Mu is going to be Lebesgue Haar measure. We can define it as follows. Mu of a rectangle um, of area less than or equal to 1 is going to be, that's a rectangle, it's a little product set, if you like. So product, instead of saying a rectangle of area 1, let's just say a product of intervals, j, j equals 1 to n, or even a product of sets. Why are we being so, why am I being so um, gentle here? So if bj is a copy, is a, is a measurable set inside of b, the measure of the products of the bj's is going to equal the product. So this is a product of sets. So maybe instead of writing it this way, I should write this as, that's a product, an n-fold product, is the product of the measures this is on the circle. Of this of the individual sets. OK, so this is a construction of a product measure exercise. If you've never seen this before is to show that this actually defines a measure. So once you've defined these are kind of like a product set, so sort of rectangles, rectangular sets. These generate the sigma algebra of all 
Borel measurable set, so I should say, B equals a little J there, Borel sets. All right. And now we're going to do something that generalizes that generalizes multiplication by two. So we're going to take a set A, uh, uh, sorry, a matrix, n by n matrix, integer entries. Um, and let's assume that the determinant of A is not zero. Very important. Then A takes, well, if I look at multiplication by such a matrix, and I take a vector whose entries are integers, then I get a vector whose entries are integers. So I get that this quotient, that, sorry, that A of Zn is Zn. But now that means we get a commutative diagram as before. Here we send a point x to Ax. Here again we have the quotient but now this is the quotient by the integers. Well, if I take an x and I add some m, m in zn, and I apply it by, I apply an integer matrix to it, I'm translating again by an integer. And that means that there's a well-defined quotient map to this quotient. And I'll call it f sub a, or maybe I'll just call it a sometimes, because it's very similar to a. And this is what's known as homomorphism of the torus. So and it's non-trivial. So let's give, let's name this quotient, call it Tn. F sub A, mini exercise, this is a group, and this is a homomorphism. A little bit harder. is to show that f sub a star of Lebesgue is Lebesgue. It actually preserves Lebesgue measure. So that's also an exercise. But do it in the case where the determinant of a is 1. Okay, that's the easiest case. Because determinant of A equals 1, this implies that F sub A is actually invertible. In fact, it's almost equivalent, because the determinant of A could be minus 1. This implies that F sub A is invertible. And so to prove that the measure is preserved, you just need the key observation. calculus, actually from linear algebra, is the following fact 
if B is a subset of Rn, measurable, so Borel set, then the Lebesgue measure of F inverse, so let's draw a picture. Um, and uh, A is invertible. We have the so-called change of variables formula. And we're going to see this again, but in the nonlinear setting, where we replace A by a determinant. Then here's A. Uh, sorry, here's B. Here's A inverse of B. There's the pre-image of B. I'll draw it over here. The Lebesgue measure of B, sorry, I probably can't see that. The Lebesgue measure of the set B is the same as the determinant of A times the Lebesgue measure times the Lebesgue measure of A inverse of B. Okay? This is actually the change of variables formula or the key, and I should say this should be the absolute value of the determinant because maybe the determinant of A is negative. That's a key property of linear maps, and that's in nonlinear dynamics. That's what, that's what uh, uh, you do a nonlinear version to prove that various um, systems um, preserve measure or have certain properties with respect to measure, okay, how measure is transformed, Lebesgue measure. Okay. Now, so just to summarize, this n-dimensional torus with, again, the Borel sigma algebra, I keep using B kind of for different things, but this is different spaces. This is the Borel sigma algebra of Tn, and this is Lebesgue measure on Tn. This is preserved by the map F sub A, as long as the determinant of A is non-zero. Okay. So determinant one, it's pretty easy. Higher determinant, you have to know something about what's called the degree of a map. So the fact, like with multiplication by two, the, um, the number of pre-images was two. In higher dimensions, the number of pre-images under a map, linear map A on the torus, number of pre-images is the absolute value of the determinant of A. So it's a very similar calculation. But don't worry, I'm not really going to talk much about higher dimensions, except for dimension two for now. I need to show my slides, and there they are. Brilliant. OK. So now, in the last minutes, I just want to slowly walk through. Um, I want my clicker to work, but I want to slowly walk through an example. And this is the example we're just going to beat the crap out of this week. You're going to be so sick of this example by the end of the week. But we're going to use this example to generate other examples. OK, so here we are, dimension two. Just want to make sure we're all on the same page. So the torus, the two-dimensional torus is R2 mod Z2. OK, there's R2. There's a distinguished point in R2. That's the origin. That's a point that's fixed by any linear map, right? Linear maps, linear transformations preserve the origin. Uh, and then inside, and giving me trouble here. Uh, inside, I can't move, basically. 
uh, inside of R2, just like we had the integer points on the real line, we have uh, Z2. Those are the points with integer coordinates. And just to give you a sense of why that quotient is a torus, and how we find the analog of 0, 1 with its endpoints identified, let's look at what happens when we take a line segment, in particular the line segment here between 0, 0 and 1, 0, and we add something in Z2. So, for example, if we were to add the vector 1, 1, that line segment would move over there. And in the quotient, those two line segments are the same. Similarly, that's the same, that's the same, and so on. Okay, so in particular, those two line segments are the same because I can move by one zero and I get the same segment. Well, similarly, if I take this segment, segment zero one, I'm sorry, one zero, I can translate it around by elements of Z2. Notice how the endpoints always end up in points in Z2 because in the quotient, all those black points become the same point. And in the quotient, all of those blue vertical lines, be segments, become the same segment, and similarly for the red. Now, inside of that square, <clears throat> no two points inside of that square are identified with each other, right? On the other hand, any other point in R2, like if I went over there, can be translated back into that square, right? So if I had a point over there, somewhere in that square, I could translate it back, okay? So that square is what we call a fundamental domain for the action of Z2 on R2. <clears throat> that is to say, the torus, the two-dimensional torus, <coughs> is just a square. I mean, probably many of you, or if not all of you, have seen this before. It's just a square with the opposite edges identified um, by translating either vertically or horizontally. Now, by the way, that's not the only fundamental domain for the action of Z2 on the square. In fact, I could take, well, I could take, for example, a parallelogram of area one and translate it around. And that could be, with the opposite edges identified, that's also a fundamental domain. In fact, if I take any matrix with integer entries and determine it one, and I apply it to that square, and I glue opposite sides, I get the same old torus. It's, it's also a fundamental domain. So that's just a little point. It's not so crucial to what I'm going to say. I'm going to go about five more. Okay. Okay, so maybe this is in the way or something. Okay, so now I'm going to consider a very special linear automorphism of uh, <coughs> a two-dimensional torus, the quotient, and that is um, where I take a matrix A equals to this integer matrix. Okay, notice it has determinant one. So it's gonna produce an invertible map on the torus, an invertible, what you might call an automorphism, because it's a homomorphism that's invertible. So we call this a linear automorphism of the torus. We also call it the cat map, and I will explain why at the, at the end of this lecture. So let's just see very, very concretely what happens when we apply 2111 to the torus. Okay. So there's our fundamental domain. Now let's just apply A to that square, right? We get a parallelogram. And in fact, well, the two columns, 21 and 11, describe the images of those two cor corner points, right? And then that's 3, 2, that's the sum of these two. So that, that guy there is also a fundamental domain for the torus, if I identify opposite edges. But now let's reassemble it to see what the image actually looks like from the point of view of the original torus. This is like when we graphed x goes to 2x, and then we cut this piece down 
and showed the graph on the interval. So there, I'm going to overlay four isomorphic fundamental domains of my original map. And I'm going to use that to cut the image into pieces and then reassemble them. Now, that picture that I just gave gives a good indication of what this invertible map look does. For example, and we'll see more of this later, the eigendirections for 2, 1, 1, 1. <clears throat> well, it's a linear map, right? They're actually perpendicular in this case. Well, when I apply the map, one eigendirection, which is the eigenvalue greater than 1, so there's two eigenvalues here, one greater than 1, the other the inverse less than 1, one is going to get expanded and one's going to get contracted. And you can sort of see that just by one iteration of this map that we get the sort of squishing in this direction and expanding in this direction. Now, why does this map preserve area? Well, there's some set sitting inside. Let's just look at an open set. And let's just see what is the pre-image of a set like this. Really concretely, well, if I apply F to that um, set that's inside, uh, I don't know why I did it this way. Um, ah, yes, I'm sorry. So if I look at that original set, but I express it in terms of uh, this new set, uh, I'm sorry, f of this set, uh, it looks like this. Now if I apply f inverse to this object, I'm going to get a set that, well, because I did f inverse, it's going to be kind of stretched along the contracting eigendirection and expanded along the, uh, expanded along the contracting eigendirection for A, because it's the inverse, and stretched, I'm sorry, and contracted along the expanding, <laughs> okay? So in any case, if we looked at a picture of this inside of the plane, uh, this would be what the pre-image of that set there looks like under 2111. And it has the same area for precisely the reason that the determinant of the inverse of this map is the same as the determinant, uh, is one over the determinant of this map, which is one. And you can see that those, if I drew them reasonably, they have the same area. So we're going to examine a lot of properties of this map and then later perturbations of this map. Here's why it's called the cat map. So there's a book by Arnold and Aves. It's a classic book. It's a bunch of lecture notes uh, of Arnold's. And at the end of the book is a huge sequence of appendices. And this is an illustration from that. So this isn't actually the map 2111. Uh, it's the map 1112. <laughs> OK, very similar. And what Ar Arnold did was very similar to what I just animated here. Um, except he wanted to show what happens to a cat, depicted in the lower left, when you apply the map to the cat and then reassemble. And that's a picture of what happens when you do that twice. And what you're seeing is that the cat is getting really, really stretched out and really skinny in this direction. And it's basically moving everywhere in this torus. And that's a property called mixing. It implies a property called ergodicity. And that property is what Hannah is going to talk about in the next lecture. By the way, I'm deliberately going over a little bit because of the activity at the beginning, but we'll just stretch things out a little bit in this lecture. Um, so that's the example we want to just understand. Let me give you some exercises. Okay. So, I gave you some, some kind of beginning warm-up exercises. You might have seen it last week. Remind yourself. Um, show that all three of the examples, to the, to the extent that you can. So exercises to summary, summarize. One is to show all examples that I gave are measure-preserving transformations. Secondly, so the board. 
Oh, so I shouldn't give exercises yet? Uh, at 2 p.m. All right, so I'll just give you a quick preview because I don't want to wait. Thank you. So I don't want to like waste too much time, but it give you something to think about. Okay, and then we'll state them in more detail. So the second exercise is to prove that the set of periodic points for 2, 1, 1, 1, so a periodic point is a point that comes back to itself, prove that that set, right, so zero zeros in that set, prove that that set is dense in T2. Another exercise is to prove that create a puzzle. The puzzle will consist of five right triangles. And you can assemble them in two different ways. One is as two squares, and the other is as one square. OK, so think about the torus and, and, do, and try to construct such an example. Think about 2, 1, 1, 1. It might be helpful. Next exercise, and I will give hints and guidance for some of these. OK, next exercise is, is quite a bit hard, harder. So construct two measures on the circle that are both invariant under multiplication by 2. They both are fully supported, meaning that the measure of any uh, open set is positive. OK, so they both, and yet they are singular with respect to each other, meaning that there's a set of full measure, that, or a set that has measure 1 for one of the measures that has measure 0 for the other. So construct two of those. And um, if you're really feeling ambitious, construct infinitely many. Exercise three, or exercise n. Think of the middle thirds canter set as a subset of the circle, and show that that's invariant under multiplication by two. Okay? And that's enough. <laughs> I, will, I will give more details. What? Yeah, yeah. So I will, I will artfully curate which ones we will talk about in the session. For now, those are just things to think about okay, over lunch or something. But I will, I will narrow it down to, to a, you know, three questions or two questions that we'll talk about in the session. OK, so I should, I should stop now. Thanks.